my family and I were really excited to jump out to Cross City North. We've been coming to Euless for over six years together now, and we are excited about being able to reach kids within our own communities, our own schools. My hope for our neighbors and our community out here is that they'll be able to find a great church home, grow with it, strong communities, and find an awesome loving environment to help raise their kids and become strong believers of Christ. I've been a student at Cross City for a few years now, and I've worked in the children's ministry, and when Kent brought it up that the church was opening a satellite in Roanoke, I was so excited, and um, I'm so excited to use my talents that I've developed here to go and reach families and kids down in the North Campus. We started going to Cross City Church about 15 years ago. And we were able to um, really, for the last five years, engage a, a, a big part of the, the mature group there and have um, a great engagement with the opportunity to have about a hundred on our roll. We had felt after five years that there was something else that we were supposed to be doing. At the time we didn't know necessarily it was the satellite and we didn't know all the details about the satellite. But once we started to hear that, you know, it's not for us just because it's closer. It's because we felt like there was something else that we were supposed to be involved in. We shared a lot of life together there at the church, being in the community, um, being engaged to getting married, to having children, and seeing God come through in a lot of ways in our lives there. We've lived here in Trophy Club for four years and we love our community. And one of the things we love about it is it's full of families. Um, but one of the things we see about our community is that there is a lot of unchurched. And I feel like it's because there's not a church in the area that fulfills their needs and fits their family. Um, and so one of the things that we are so excited about is that Cross City's coming here and we know that we're a good fit for this group. If we can go back to all of those months ago that John asked me if I would like to take on this campus pastor role. From that moment on, uh, just in all of my prayers and talking to my family uh, and talking to people who were be interested in doing that, like the excitement, it has grown by the minute. John and I started talking about what would be like the, the best series. I mean, we kicked around a lot of names, but then Man, Game Changer, it just, it landed hard on me. And I was like, what if we did Game Changer? Because man, if we go back to all of history, who was the biggest Game Changer that ever walked the planet? It's Jesus. He's the author of it all. He's the perfecter of it all. He's the finisher of it all. And man, we get to be a part of it. Why in the world would we not want to say, hey, let's let Game Changer be the series that we start off this brand new satellite with? Man, let's jump in together and let's see what he does across all of these campuses as we make up Cross City Church. Well, I'm excited to tell you about the fact that we went out there in between the services and had such a great time. And not only are the 100 volunteers that went out there active and working and serving and everything's working so well, but it looks like there are just under 300 people total out there. So that 100 has already seen 200 more come in in one day. That's amazing, it really is. And uh, if, you've ever, if you've ever heard Kent Wells preach, you can imagine how excited he is now. And I'm not sure he'll finish preaching today. I'm really not sure what's gonna happen, but we were so excited to be able to see God use this in such a huge way. And I wanna say to the congregation here at uh, Cross City Church First Euless, just thank you so much for the, uh, the flexibility, for the willingness, for the dedication, for the prayer, for everything that you have done to allow us to plant a satellite there in Northwest Tarrant County. I do believe God is gonna bless in a great, great way and lives are going to be changed and that's really what it's all about. I was surprised at how the whole range of age groups were out there. I saw an 80 year old woman that usually worshiped here who was out there who said, I live blocks from this high school, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna help. Everybody from 80 down to, to eight were there and I just really appreciated how God is using this whole thing. It's exciting, it's exciting to be a part uh, of a church that's reaching out like that. So thank you so much for that. Now, do you have your Bibles? If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up today and turn to the book of Acts today, Acts chapter one. And we're launching our series in all of our venues. And the name of our series is Game Changer. And we already have revealed to you who the Game Changer is. And you already know that answer. It's automatic in the church that Jesus is the Game Changer. But the book of Acts is a book where we are reading exactly how he changes 
the game in our lives, in the church, and in the world. So Acts chapter one. Now, before we read the text, let me just say to you that, that as people have read the book of Acts and studied this book over the years, and we'll, we'll simply just look at the first four chapters over the next seven weeks, not the whole book, just four chapters, where we look at the foundation of the church, where we're reminded about all that Jesus had in mind for the church and all he has in mind for us together. But as you read the book of Acts and you read what others write about the book of Acts, you'll see that there are many subtitles for the book of Acts. I mean, the book of Acts is a simple title, Acts, but Acts of who? Acts of what? Sometimes I read about this and people say, well, this is the book called the Acts of the Apostles. The acts of those who were the followers of Jesus from the day that Jesus uh, ascended and beyond that. Others say, no, this is the book of the acts of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit works in our life as Jesus has left him to live in us. Others say, no, this is the acts of the unstoppable movement of the church. Others say, no, this is the acts of the church of Jesus Christ. Until others say, no, this is the acts of the post-resurrection of Jesus Christ, what he did on the other side of the resurrection. I can tell you, it's all the above. But there's no doubt that the game changer in the book of Acts is one person, and his name, of course, is Jesus Christ. Let's stand as we read the first 11 verses today of Acts chapter one, and as we look at how the foundation for what we do today was laid down more than 2,000 years ago. Now, the author of the book of Acts is Luke. Luke has already written a book in the Bible, and I think most of us know what it is. It's called the Gospel of Luke. I mean, we're we're star pupils here. We know that Luke wrote Luke. But Luke wrote everything dealing with the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. We spent about a year and a half going through the book of Luke here together. And so this is Luke's second book. Let's look at what it says in verse 1. This first account I composed Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. In other words, from ground zero where you are all the way around the world, you'll be my witness. Verse nine. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing, angels that is, stood beside them, and they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. In other words, he's going to come back, and in the meantime, you have work to do. And that's really part of the message of the book of Acts. Father, today, reveal to us all we need to know as we lay down the foundation for this journey through these first four incredibly important chapters in the book of Acts. We ask that you do this in Jesus' name. And our God's people said, amen. 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 Please be seated if you would. That this book is about Jesus is undeniable. That it's about the church is undeniable. That it's about you is sometimes missed. Not just you in the sense that you're the church, but it's about you and how Jesus is going to work in your life to the same degree, if not even more, than he did with his disciples. I remember when I was growing up, learning to grow in the faith, learning to be discipled as a young man, I used to say things like, you know, if Jesus were here walking with me the way he walked with Peter and John, I'd probably be a much better disciple, a much better follower of Jesus if he was physically here. And then the guy discipling me said, oh no, you're all wrong. 
Because once Jesus left, he left the Holy Spirit to every believer to indwell. Jesus is with you today, and if you are not walking closer with him, it's not because you're not Peter and John and not in those eras. He's walking with you in a powerful way right now. The, the book of Acts is really about how you act, how you live, how we live together as followers of Jesus Christ. And all through this book, it's about who the game changer is in the world, in the church, and in your life. Jesus is the game changer. Can you say that with me? Jesus is the game changer. Now, we like to talk about game changers, and here we are just a couple of weeks from the Super Bowl. So we're beginning to talk a little bit about game changers. And I, I began to think back to a couple of years ago when I was headed to Anchorage, Alaska, on February the 7th, 2017. The 2016 football season had just ended and we were on a plane going to Anchorage, Alaska and it wasn't until I got on that plane that I thought, man, I'm on an airplane flying on the day the Super Bowl is playing. I mean, that's really bad booking is what that is. That's just a bad day to fly. <laughs> and so we had to fly to Seattle to catch our next flight to Anchorage, Alaska where we were doing a conference and uh, preaching and, and helping people know how to share their faith in, in Alaska. And uh, we arrived at halftime at Seattle. We looked at the screen in the waiting room at the terminal that we were leaving from and saw it was halftime. And the, the New England Patriots were behind 28 to three. They were getting bombarded by the Atlanta Falcons. Many of you remember that game just two years ago. And so our plane was uh, being delayed a little bit because of snow on the wings, which is common, you know, for somebody from Texas, right? And so, I thought, the plane is being delayed. We get to watch more of the game. Well, the third quarter happened, and, and not really a lot happened. The Patriots scored, but Atlanta didn't really respond much, but it was still like a 16-point gap. Fourth quarter started, and they called us up to go through the gate, get onto the plane. But as we were about to go to the plane, they, they radioed back and said, no, you can't go on just yet. The wings have iced again. They're going to have to de-ice again. And it, literally, everybody goes, that's good, because we can see the TV right there. And we watched Tom Brady become a game changer in the Super Bowl to an amazing degree. The Atlanta Falcons kept not scoring and Tom Brady began to throw pass after pass after pass, breaking a Super Bowl record with 43 completed passes out of 62 attempts and 466 passing yards in the Super Bowl. And they won uh, at the end of that game, it was an amazing game. And then they called us to board the plane. And I'm telling you today, it was the perfect timing. I think the Lord let me see that. I think that's what happened. <laughs> but there's no denying that, that that man, Tom Brady, on that night was the game changer. The ball was in his hand and it was the game changer. As part of my sermon preparation this week, I watched that game again last night. <laughs> Just so I'd have the details right. Game changer. Now that's the game of football. But the game of life there's a greater game changer and you want the ball in his hands. You want to know that no matter what happens, you give it to him because he's going to help you through everything you need help in in life. You have to begin to see Jesus as the go-to man, the game changer of your life. And if you don't, you'll live life without the game changer. As we walk through the book of Acts, beginning in chapter one, I want you to notice three profound effects that Jesus had on those around him. First of all, the global effect. Notice how this book opens up. The book opens up in verse one by saying, the first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus, and the next word is key, began, began to do and teach. Luke is saying, I wrote an entire book, the gospel of Luke about everything he started everything he began to do and teach. And there's no way that Luke could have documented everything Jesus did. But if you read through the book of Luke and he walked through the book of Luke, you'll see it's one of the greatest books that you can find because the theme of the gospel of Luke is the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. It's all about Jesus. Luke has one of the best descriptions of the birth of Jesus, the, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter one, verse 35, as the angel comes and speaks to Mary and she says, how can this be that I'm a child? And he said, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you and that which is uh, birth given to you will be the holy child, the holy seed of the father. And you shall name his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. An amazing description of the virgin birth and, and really the amazement of this virgin girl 
being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit is something that still astounds us today all the time. We talk about the virgin birth of Jesus and the ramifications of that and the amazing, miraculous birth of Jesus. So Luke details the birth of Jesus, but also the life of Jesus. He describes him to be the great teacher. And everywhere through the book of Luke, you find the parables of teaching uh, that Jesus gave us, the, the parables, the interactions, the conversation. He was a phenomenal teacher. A.T. Robertson, one of the great preachers of a previous century, made the statement about just one aspect of the teaching of Jesus. He said, in reference to just one parable, this parable of the Good Samaritan has built the world's hospital and if understood in practice, will remove racial prejudice, national hatred, war, and class jealousy. And he's correct. If we just follow just that simple teaching of Jesus Christ found in the Good Samaritan, the world will be turned upside down because Jesus was a phenomenal teacher sent from God. So it's about his birth, this book of Luke that's been written. It's about his teaching. It's about Jesus as a healer. The compassion that was in the life of Jesus was amazing, but not only was he compassionate, but he always acted on that compassion. He had passion in action, and Jesus was supernaturally empowered to, to raise up the lame, to help the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He was able to cast out demons, even raise the dead. And the healing ministry of Jesus is, is incredible and legendary, and we talk about it all the time. And we look back to all that he did because Jesus was a phenomenal healer. Luke described Jesus as a prophet, a man who would walk into the temple where all kinds of hypocrisy was unfolding and, and, and cast out the money changers that were trying to make a dollar off of those that just wanted simply to worship God. And Jesus as a prophet is second to none because he spoke with all the words of truth being the truth manifest. He was a phenomenal leader. Jesus was able to take 12 disciples, 11 of them followed him till they died. And he really taught them not only how to be leaders, but how to be servant leaders. He, he led them in a way that was sacrificial, led them in a way that demonstrated he loved them, he cared for them, and he grew up these rough, everyday, ordinary men and turned them into the apostles that he built the New Testament church through. An amazing Amazing leader. Ray Comfort made this statement about the leadership of Jesus. He said, comparing Jesus with history's greatest of human leaders is like comparing the sun to a flashlight that has no batteries. There is no comparison. Jesus' leadership was so brilliant. Nobody else can hold a match to all that he did in the way of leading. But Jesus was also a servant. He was a servant leader. Jesus is the one that made the statement, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And upon making that statement days later, Jesus literally laid down his life on a cross to pay for the sins of all of mankind. And today we look back to that sacrifice as the perfect atoning moment where he demonstrated his love in an undebatable way. He poured out his blood and he poured out his love for us. What an incredible servant leader. Look at the Gospel of Luke and you'll see what Luke is referring to in that, that first moment of opening up the Gospel of Acts or the book of Acts. And he's basically saying that I'm going to continue the story from the Gospel of Luke because Jesus' life continues. I, I'm not through writing because Jesus is not through working. I'm not through writing because Jesus is not through healing and Jesus is not through speaking and he's not through leading and he's not through serving. If you dare look at the book of Acts... That's just that chapter after Jesus left. You missed the point of the whole book of Acts. Acts is about Jesus continuing to do and teach what he began. And today people still write about Jesus. Believers or unbelievers. Even Gandhi, an unbeliever, a Hindu man and leader said Jesus is one of the great teachers of all mankind. And while he never gave his life to Jesus... He acknowledged Jesus as the great teacher of mankind. Many other global leaders who have never followed Christ look at him and say, there's been no one like Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. The global effect of Jesus is incredible. It's amazing. And there's simply no greater greatness than Jesus Christ himself, and the world knows it. And now the book of Acts really is the continuation of all that he began to do and to teach. Keep that in mind. Secondly, there is a personal effect because the global effect is a big deal, but there was an amazing personal effect 
And let me say this today. It is intended that you have had an effect by having an encounter with Jesus Christ, a personal effect. If you read on, you'll see the Bible says to these, that is to the apostles, to these he presented himself alive by many convincing proofs appearing to them and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So in that little line right there, Luke says, everything Jesus began to do, everything Jesus began to teach, now he continues to appear to these disciples who are going to be the foundation of the New Testament church. A personal encounter that each one of those individuals had with Jesus. Jesus revealed himself to individuals, which explains why they followed him for the rest of their lives. You want to see some examples of that? Just turn to the left of the book of Acts to the book of John. In fact, if you turn over to the left just a few pages, you'll see in John chapter 20 and verse 14, some great things unfolding after Jesus died and after he was buried. The Bible says that Mary came to the tomb the next day after Jesus was buried. And the Bible said when she had seen that he was gone, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. He was standing there in his glorified form. She saw him and was amazed that he was there. She ran to tell the disciples who came running for the tomb. And in verse 19 of John chapter 20, it says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, because they feared being persecuted or crucified themselves, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So here are these barred doors, fearful men, not sure if Mary was speaking the truth or not, and Jesus appears to them as well. He personally encounters them. Read on in John chapter 20 to verse 26. Because those gathered that day had one missing, and that was Thomas. Doubting Thomas was not there that day, but on verse 26, eight days later, they're meeting again, and Thomas is there. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, the Bible says, and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Even the doubter got to see him this time which helps me understand that even if we're doubters, Jesus will give us an encounter to help us be convinced that he's real. In John chapter 21, verse 13, we see it again. Jesus came and took the bread. Now this time in John 21, the disciples have gone back fishing because Jesus has given them a little bit of time from the first post-resurrection appearance. And now they're saying, what do we do now? I guess we'll go fish some more. And they go out not being very successful. Jesus comes to the shore and says, I want you to fish over this way. And they do, and it's got an amazing catch of fish. They come to the side, prepare the fish, and Jesus hands them bread and fish. And here's what it says. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So let me summarize that. Jesus presented himself to people. He convinced people. He appeared to people. He spoke to people. He still does this today. But Jesus is not dead. He still does this today. I've had a number of encounters with Jesus in my lifetime, and I love to tell the stories about them. The first encounter I had with Jesus Christ happened when I was a young boy. And I remember being in bed one night. Those of you that know my story know that I lost 95% of my hearing as a young boy. And uh, so I was legally deaf, didn't hear sounds the way everyone else hears sounds, and later on had to have hearing aids in order to hear anything. And, um, but when I was young and didn't have those hearing aids. I was asleep one night and I literally heard someone call my name. I remember so clearly because I'd never heard anything so clearly in my life at that moment. And they called my name. They said, Johnny, which only my parents had ever called me and only the Lord has ever called me. You don't have permission to call me Johnny. <laughs> Johnny. I woke up. I was afraid at first. Went back to sleep. Heard it again. It was undeniable. It was clear as it could be. Johnny. The next morning, I told my parents what had happened. And they took me to the book of 1 Samuel. And they said, you know, God speaks to people, even young children. And he calls them to himself. And they read me the story of 1 Samuel, how the boy Samuel had heard from the Lord who called his name. And my parents told me what that book said is what I ought to do. Go back and say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. 
And that's what I did. And a few days later, I gave my life to Christ because I was convinced he was calling me personally, personally calling me to follow him. Now, you don't have to hear God audibly to know that you are having an encounter with Christ. He can encounter us in many, many different ways. But that is an undeniable, unforgettable encounter I had with Jesus Christ. About 12 years later, I remember being 17, 18 years of age, having walked with God for a time, but also having a season of sin, a season of I want to do things my own way, if you know what that's like. And during that period of time, I became convinced that my life was being threatened. And I went out to a field of a friend of mine, laid in a wheat field all by myself, as the sun went down and said, God, I have messed my life up. I want to come back. If you're real, if you're as real as I remember you being, I want you to show me your presence. And God showed me his presence so powerfully that day, not with something I could see, this time not with something I could hear, but his presence was so, so tangible. I knew he was there. I knew he was speaking to me. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and I have never been the same since that time. Jesus still speaks today. Jesus still still encounters people. He still reveals himself to people, and they have a personal effect that is undeniable. The disciples gave their lives because they personally encountered Jesus. Men and women surrendered their sins and gave them up. They repented and turned towards Jesus because of those encounters. They gave their current lives to Jesus. They gave their future lives to Jesus because he's worth following. That's why people make a decision to be saved, to have salvation happen because they realize that Jesus offers salvation. That's why they're baptized, to publicly identify with him. That's why they sacrifice things in their life to follow him. That's why they're on a mission because they've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's why they're willing to go through persecution because if you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you're never the same and you can't live for yourself anymore. The book of Acts is about a group of people that have had a personal encounter with Jesus. And the Bible says they turn the world upside down. You know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the world needs to be turned upside down again. I mean, I look around me and I think everything's messed up. Everything's messed up. And I don't have any hope apart from Jesus and those who follow Jesus, that's where my hope is. But the personal effect that happens when we have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ is incredible. C.T. Studd, one of the most most quotable men I've ever read, made this statement. He said, if Jesus be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If that's what he did for me, then I'm willing to do anything to follow Jesus Christ. And our lives, the direction of our lives are changed because of this personal encounter. You know, some of us have had encounters with other individuals that have marked our lives, that have helped us move in a certain direction, different than what we were doing before. Some of us have had personal encounters with other human beings that changed us. More than 41 years ago, I met the young woman who's now my wife. And um, as I met her, I got to know her. I was walking with the Lord and And I realized she really knew the Lord. She really knew the Word. She was dedicated to follow Christ. And as I got to know her, we were both college students, I realized I'll change anything in my life to follow this woman. I'll change anything to be her husband. That's really what happened. I'm still changing things to be her husband, by the way. (laughs) She finds them all the time. Oh, that's a great human relationship. But let me elevate that. Because not everybody has that great human relationship, but let me tell you something everybody can have. That great superhuman relationship with the infinite God-man who came to relate to you. The one who came and who is perfect in all his ways, who has done everything necessary to change your life, to forgive you, to set you free. And I'm telling you today, it ought to change your life when you encounter Jesus Christ, amen? Are you with me today? Are you with me? Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. That's something worth clapping for. But there's something else. Because this text here talks about the church effect. Look in verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. And then the rest of this chapter and the next one tells how Jesus continues to be a game changer in the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. It speaks of spiritual power of being witnesses, of touching other lives with the power of Jesus inside of us. 
In other words, the Jesus who changes the world and the Jesus who changes us wants us to be agents by which the world is changed. That's our mission. He's dwelling inside of us and the promise that we'll look at, the promise of the Holy Spirit coming upon every believer and indwelling every believer is what we'll look at in the weeks to come in great detail. But first of all, just see it's the effect on the church that changes everything. There's power in that encounter. I love what it says in verse 11 as you get to the end of what we've read here today. And it says, they also said, men of Galilee, why you stand looking up in the sky? This is when Jesus has ascended. Why are you looking in the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up for you to heaven will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. I love that line because I can just see those disciples never having seen anything like that, staring at the sky as Jesus ascends and having been told, stop looking, stop waiting, go work. He'll be back one day. How many of you were aware of and maybe went outside and saw the blood moon about a week ago. Would you raise your hand if you went out and did that? I mean, I saw so many pictures on Facebook and other places. Everybody was taking pictures of the blood moon. And all kinds of prophecies written about the blood moon. All kinds of books are out there. And there are a lot of people who name the dates of Jesus' return based on the latest blood moon. And now they're writing new books about the next blood moon because Jesus didn't come back at the other blood moon. So it's all about that, right? And so I, I went outside with my son, Joe, and uh, we're, watching, we're watching this blood moon about 10.30 at night. And uh, as we're staring into the sky, 30 degrees, I don't have the kind of clothing on for 30 degrees. And after a few moments, I thought, why am I staring into the sky? Because I can go get better pictures than that on Facebook. Some other people have taken them. And it's cold. And it's going to come back. So I'm going in. But these disciples were looking up into the sky because the one that transformed their lives was ascending at the moment. And they were so transfixed by the ascension of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus up into heaven that the angel had to kind of shake them and say, it's time to go to work. You need to tell other people what you've seen. And that's the era we're in right now. Don't stand looking into the sky. Don't try to figure out when Jesus is coming by the next blood moon. I assure you, you'll be wrong. But you serve him until he chooses to come back. And you realize that the impact of his life on the church is incredible. You see, Jesus is the game changer of all we do as the church. He's why we're different. Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 12 said, greater things than these miracles you see I see because I go to be with the Father. And his point is, I'm leaving the Holy Spirit with you and he'll be dwelling inside of every single believer. And these miracles, these powerful things will be multiplied because you will be the church who walks out in my presence. That's powerful. Here's how I want you to see the church according to the book of Acts. You must see it like this. It's not, don't see the church as after Jesus left, the church began. That's kind of anticlimactic. Jesus was here, did all kinds of miracles. He died, was buried, rose again. And then after Jesus left, well, the church began. If you see the church like that, you missed the whole point of the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts and every other book in the New Testament is not about that. It's not anticlimactic. It is this. After the spirit of Jesus came to dwell in every believer, the church began. Man, that's a whole different story. Not after Jesus died, the church started, but after the Holy Spirit came, the church started. After he began to dwell in every single one of our lives, after the Spirit of Jesus began dominating our lives, that's when the church began with those New Testament disciples still walking with Jesus, the book of Acts still writing about the works of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus personified and lived out. There's hope for the world because of Jesus today. There's hope for the church because of Jesus today. There's hope for you because of Jesus today. That's what Acts is all about. And as we read Acts, as we walk through Acts, we're going to be reminded over and over when the game is on the line, every team is wise to put the ball in the hand of the game changer. And that game changer is Jesus. There's not a simpler message out there. There's nothing deep and profound about that. It's just that few actually play the game that way. Few actually put the ball in his hands. They know he's a game changer, but they insist on running their own play and they get tackled every time. 
You know, it takes the decision to move from a watcher of Jesus to be a follower of Jesus. To see Jesus as a great man the way Gandhi did. To be someone who says, Jesus is the man the way a follower of Christ would say. Instead of talking about the greatness of his teachings, we ought to be talking about the greatness of his power inside of us to do his work in a continuing way today. And if you haven't had that personal encounter, you can have it today. I'm not telling you that you should see Jesus physically. I'm not saying that you have to hear him audibly. I'm saying, though, that he has made it possible for you to have a living encounter with a living Christ. And I invite you to put your faith in him now. That's why Hebrews says, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Would you bow your head for just a moment? And as we bow, I'm going to call our counselors forward. And as our counselors come forward, we're going to sing a brief song in just a moment. And as these men and women stand at the front facing you, it's an opportunity and an invitation for you to walk just 30 steps, 30, 40 steps forward. Take their hand and say to them, today, I want to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And they'll, they'll be happy to pray with you, answer questions for you. It may be today that you want to come and give your life to Christ and, and allow him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. To let him live within you. To let him be the game changer for your life. It may be today that you want to come having already made that decision and join this church as we seek to be a people who look to the game changer day in and day out, whatever it is. I'm going to urge you when we stand and when we sing to walk forward and make a decision. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us today as we sing. Thank you, Father, that you have encountered hundreds and thousands and millions of people over the years in a personal way that transformed their lives. Help every person in this room have that kind of encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me?